Hey everybody, what's up? Welcome to a brand new episode of Big Dumb Monsters. I am Chris. And I am Nick. And this week we are joined by a very special guest, Ken Reed of the TV Guidance Counselor podcast. Uh, joins us to talk the 1990, uh, as we learned, legal placeholder film, yeah. Night of the Living Dead, the remake of uh, Night of the Living Dead, uh, directed by Tom Savini. Um... Uh, yeah, I, I we talk about this on the episode. I I absolutely like loved this movie uh, when I was younger, and like now have a much much harsher critical eye of it. Uh, yeah, I had only seen it a couple of times before we watched it for this uh, the show, and then I watched it three times in the past week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm up to like two, I think. Yeah, I'm done with it for now. Yeah, like it's it's good, but yeah, like I said at the end of the episode, like I need a ten year zombie break. Yeah, uh, but we talked Night of the Living Dead. Uh, Nick and Ken get off on a, uh, a tangent on uh, on on the Misfits. On uh, uh, you guys were just going like naming bands. I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, yep, <laughs> nod and smile. <laughs> but that's what we do. That's uh... yeah, no, it's all good. Uh, it was great having Ken on. Yeah, he's uh, fantastic. Yeah, as you'll hear uh, in the ensuing episode. Yeah, I hope you enjoy. Bye bye. This, uh, I always find it, it's hard to talk about movies that we love. I say that whenever we're talking about a movie that we love, because we always just start like gushing about it. Like, I, I just love it. I love it. Like, there's really not much else to say besides that. Um, and I thought, I kind of thought that I was going to go that way with this one, but I, I got a little bit more critical, uh, on viewing, uh, it this is, time. it is definitely hard to be critical of a movie that you really like. Yeah. But there are, there are things that you can pick at in this one. Well, um, this one the biggest... is. Oh. Sorry, go ahead, Ken. That Skype delay. Sorry. Uh, this one <laughs> is interesting in that it it literally is a cash in. Like from go, the reason they made it. Uh, do you know this story? No. Uh, so, so there's infamously the original Night of the Living Dead. Uh, they forgot to copyright it. It was originally called Night yeah, of it's the a public Flesh domain Eaters, movie now. And there was another movie. Yeah, so they inadvertently made a public domain. So they really didn't make any profit off the original Night of the Living Dead. So they essentially made this movie to reclaim the copyright. That's the only reason they made this movie. And it, which is why we got a bunch of like uh like DVD and home video releases, the original night later, all coming from them sort of reclaiming the copyright for Night of the Living Dead by making this 1990 remake, uh, which is for a movie literally just made for a legal purpose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, a, it's a 90 job. minute legal document, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It, it's a it's a 90 minute I think, claim stake. Yeah, and I think monetarily, the only thing they would have gotten out of that was the name because this didn't really do that well uh in it, its theatrical run i think yeah it, i remember pretty much just coming and going like, i think it made in about a million in profit maybe a million too which i mean is, is they, significant they, money but which they knew they they had pre-sold they essentially got the budget for this movie from the home video uh sales pre-selling mm. so the theatrical release was almost like we we had in the last few years where the you know the the theatrical release was just kind of a commercial for the dvd to be purchased <laughs> this was yeah, yeah, sort of yeah. a, uh like you know if we make any money on this at all it's kind of bonus we're just reclaiming our copyright on it and it's a little bit of a shame because romero we got a Romero movie every decade for three for three decades. So we had the '60s one, the '70s one, and the '80s one, and they all kind of reflect yeah. those decades. And we were sort of robbed of a true '90s Romero zombie movie. Uh, so this was yeah, pretty true. much as good as we're getting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, this one is set in '89, so I guess technically you get it, but it's it's too much of a rehash for it to be on its own. I, yeah, I never noticed before that they actually say the date. It's August twenty third, nineteen eighty nine. Yeah, uh, it was on the radio at one point when Ben's listening to the radio. Yep. But yeah, it's it's definitely it doesn't feel like nineteen eighty nine at all. Yeah. Other than colored television. 
Um, well, it's rural Pennsylvania. They're always at least 20 years behind. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> They're just getting the early 2000s. Emo's big right now in, in central Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. yeah. WWE is massive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, kids doing the stunner to each other right now. <laughs> um, I feel like this is getting a little bit more due um, kind of now. I know I've I've brought it up. Um, on podcasts with guests before and I, I keep kind of hearing like people finally saying like you know I really do like this version of it um, I've always kind of been of that mind it, it's for what it is it's it's pretty good you know like like what you're saying it's it's a placeholder a legal placeholder um, but I think they, they did a pretty good job of it for what it is it is a good refresh of yeah. the movie yeah it's also the most influential of how people have depicted zombies for the last 30 years basically like the the zombies on the walking dead are directly from night of living dead 1990 they're not day of the dead zombies they're certainly not dawn of the dead zombies or yeah. like they are day of the dead 1990 zombies and it's kind of like uh you know the knv guys were all working for savini and they were like all right we nailed it we, this is perfect now we got zombie this is we don't need to innovate <laughs> any further this yeah, is exactly we have a zombie, we like. a zombie template. Let's just keep going back to that. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, it, and it kind of is just a like a 90 minute special effect, which is why Savini was a good choice to direct it. And also why you really haven't seen him direct anything else after that. <laughs> yeah, he's he's acted in a bunch of stuff. I think this this was his first directorial role um his first film was, he directed a bunch of he directed a few episodes of tales from the dark side oh did he really okay oh so he got his his uh his claws in a, a little bit of tv first um i was actually surprised it wasn't gorier with savini at the helm um i know he didn't have a whole lot to do with uh like designing and, and making the special effects because he was directing it but I would have figured he would have uh, like a heavier hand in it, but it, it doesn't really have like his, I don't know, his uh, style. To it, it. It's not like dripping blood in every yeah. scene. Like the, the one scene that always sticks out to me is the scene where Tom and Judy die in the gas tank explosion. Um, in the original one, like that's actually pretty gory when they, like after the explosion, like the zombies come in and you can see them like pulling entrails, like out of the corpses and like yeah. eating the entrails. Yep. And like in this one, they're just kind of like yeah, moving easily the body the parts around. It's easily the goriest scene in the original, by far, yeah. like by a mile. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yep. Um, those are real guts, too. Are they really? Yeah, they got those at a, no, like a butcher guts, shop. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I think, I think they paid them extra to eat those. What, I mean, uh, I, I believe it's the, char- the actors that play Tom and Judy. They also play zombies in that scene. Do they really? <laughs> I didn't notice that. Yeah, no. yeah. Uh, they're <laughs> almost all the main actors double duty in the original Living Dead. Like, um, I think um, the the mother of of the the kid that gets killed in the basement. I believe mm-hmm. she's the zombie that that scene where it kind of picks a bug off a tree and eats it. Oh <laughs> yeah, yeah. One shot or she's kind of, uh, I believe that's her. But so and, and this one, they, uh... angling. I was gonna say we we had that, that similar scene in this one. Instead of the uh, the bug, he picks up a mouse, the mouse and yeah. eats it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it, <laughs> Savini was kind of angling to be more of an action director, I think, which is why that um, that death scene with the gas tanks exploding is shot more like a Van Damme movie or something. <laughs> yeah, it's it's got that that it's very lion hearty. That's got that stank on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think he was trying to be. A, I, th- I think he was also trying to be artistic with this because, like, the kills aren't super gory. Um, a lot actually happens off camera. Um, and you've got uh, certain homages to the original movie without it being, like, a blatant ripoff. Um, you know, like, he'll he'll frame a scene kind of the same way it was, uh, it was in the original, but then um, it's got, like, a, a different spin on, on what actually happens. Yeah, I think that's my favorite thing about this sort of reinterpretation piece is that if you'd never seen the original Night of the Living Dead, th- you don't need to. This plays as a perfectly good horror movie in 1990. But if you have seen the original and you're really familiar with it, 
it's almost better in that they know how familiar you familiar you are with the original and so every sort of place it deviates from the original is surprising and interesting and they do it in a way that makes sense it's almost like a uh it's like a what if of the original like a choose your own adventure yeah. where you just picked a different chapter from the original i uh I, I I thought about that actually in one scene in particular because um, I think the biggest deviation is um, uh, Patricia Tallman's character Barbara. Um, she mm -hmm. goes from like useless bystander basically in the original one to like taking control of the situation you know at some point and kind of like you know she's the survivor of the group, but she exits the house pretty much in the same way like in the original one you know the zombies are coming in and she gets pulled out. And in this one, it's the zombies are coming in, but she like dodges you know, our way out to go get yeah. help. Yeah, it was weird. Yeah, and she's the one who turned her saying, into like, an action hero. She's the one who's like, they're so they're so slow. <laughs> we yeah, can walk yeah. right by them. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember this like sticking to the original a lot more. I think I even said to you, Ken, when we were like when we were texting and setting this up, like it's pretty close to the original. And as I'm watching it, I'm like, this is a lot different. Like, especially towards the end. Like the ending is a lot different. Um I think yeah, for the better. All the relationships you know, like, are different. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah all no the worries. relationships are different. Um, like Barbara's character is, is very much different. Um even even the Ben character, uh, which you superficially think is going to be the same because, you know, they've cast Tony Todd. Um, he And it, he's a very different character. Like, he's a lot I found less. Him, I found him altruistic. way less likable. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think, like, allow me to be, like, kind of, like, cerebral with it. I think that's kind of, like, evolving the character for the times a little bit. Like, you know, in the sixties, like he would have had to have been like probably a lot politer, like, you know, with just in society in general, like with yeah. racism, like it's a lot, not that, you know, we're rid of it now, but yeah. you know, like he probably would have been a lot politer used to being a lot, you know, especially around like a group of white people in that type of situation where people have guns and like, he's probably gonna be a lot more polite where, you know, in the nineties, like, you know, still we're not that far along, but he, he's probably got, you know, probably feel a, bit, a little bit more comfortable yeah. being, you know, not as friendly, like taking control a little more. Well, it's interesting because when when I think back of the the original, um, Cooper is actually right the whole time. So that's like <laughs> the weird rub of that movie is he's such an asshole and he's sort of painted as the villain, but he's right. Gone down and all gone down to the basement and locked the door and waited out the night. Uh, you know, aside from having to deal with I think Karen, the kid who gets reanimated, yeah. which I think all of them down there could have dealt with. Um, yeah. They would have been fine. And Ben is the one who has a plan that ends up getting them killed, really. And in this one, it, it, Tony Todd almost plays it like Ben is coming in and he's being, he's sort of bullying his way into a leadership role that ultimately makes everyone worse off. <laughs> Yeah, and you get that <laughs> yeah. a little bit more here, where you're like, he's bullying them into into this plan that's not going to work. Yeah, I'll take control, but you're not that good of a leader. Don't worry, I've got it. Like, no, yeah. no, no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Actually, um, when I when I was watching, I I, I was thinking the much better plan, like, because I, I when I was watching, like, I'm thinking, what's drawing all these zombies? Is them banging on the like nailing up the boards and stuff that's drawing more zombies the sounds of the hammers sure if they like you said either gone into the basement or better yet gone upstairs and then just like blocked the stairway like barricaded the stairs with furniture or something yeah you would have you you would have like you know you've had that same type of isolation like you would have had in the basement but you also would have had an escape route if you really needed you could have gone out a window or something yeah what's what's kind of crazy is he winds up uh ben winds up going downstairs and turning into a zombie, and then Cooper winds up going upstairs and being rescued. Yeah, to to flip that whole idea on its head. But if they'd have at least tried to work together at any point during this, like <laughs> they could have figured something out. Well, I think it was the point of Ben finding the gas, uh, the gas pump key. Yeah, like that's you know, it's, he just starts like he's he's like a complete nervous breakdown at that point. And yeah, he just sees the key and is like, oh great, like starts laughing. Yeah, but it's it's the, it's that shitty situation where you have two alphas and they just butt heads and nobody gives in to anybody. Yeah. 
But I mean, that's kind of the the whole point of so much of the Romero stuff. And again, you, I, I consider this a Romero movie, even though he didn't direct it. But one of the things that I've been thinking about over the last 18 months with the way everything's gone with COVID and Dawn of the Dead especially sort of haunts me on a daily basis. But the <laughs> whole point is that the threat is manageable. They're slow. They're they're not not inherently unbeatable. If only everybody just worked together and if people didn't only have their own best interests in mind, they could have relatively easily overcome this. So the point of those two guys not uh, working together at all and have like a weird pride when it's like, dude, you don't, this doesn't matter. Like we just need to get out of here. Like <laughs> who cares? We just need to work yeah. together and get out of here. But yeah, it doesn't matter who's right. Let's, yeah, let's survive first. We can hate each other all we want later on when we're alive. <laughs> right. Right. And that's, that's to, to me, that's sort of actually from Romero's original trilogy and into this one, that's sort of the thematically, the, the main thing is like if we just keep holding on to stupid things from the before time that don't matter now that's what's going to kill you that's what you know in dawn of the dead when the people are hoarding all their dead in the basement of the projects because they don't want to give them up because they have like you know odd re religious connection to them that's what gets kills them all going to the mall because you want to obtain all this stuff and have a weird yeah. sense of like play acting that things are normal that's what actually undo undoes them in the end and yep. it, it's every time and it, it's the same thing in this one <sighs> i never thought about that i uh like the uh going back to like the alphas butting heads like i think that was a lot like it made a lot more sense in the 60s version with ben and cooper like going at it again because of racism and this one it's never really defined why they hate each other they just hate each other like immediately and they just continue butting heads yeah i think it was i think it's more of an attitude um difference between them so uh, ben comes in and he is already trying to 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 be the helpful guy with uh Barbara, um, you know, getting the, the two or three zombies uh, out of the, the house originally. And then he finds this guy who's been hiding in the basement, kind of, I don't know, gets, sees him like a coward, possibly. Yeah. Um, and then you have... Cooper. He even calls him out and says, you know, where were you? We, you could have helped us. like Right. But then you have Cooper, who's in the basement trying to save his family. And then there's this guy upstairs making all this noise, drawing all these zombies. So that's a completely separate attitude. And it just doesn't mesh. So they're already at odds before they even see each other. Mm. Yeah, like in this one, I feel like Tony Todd, probably intentionally, plays Ben with a lot less empathy than um, he was in the original movie. In that he comes in the original movie, um, what's the actor's Dean, Dean Jones? Dwayne, um, Dwayne Jones. When Dwayne he Jones, in yeah. first. Dwayne Jones, Dwayne Jones, yeah. when he first encounters Cooper, he's more like, how's the kid? Like he's, he, he's concerned. Like he, he has a concern for them. Yeah. Um, and then Cooper's kind of like, Hey, fuck you. You know? Um, but in this one <laughs> right away, he's like confrontational with him. He doesn't give a shit that this guy's wife is down there and that his kids hurt. You know, he doesn't give a shit about what, how, what happened to Barbara. He's just like, shut the hell Shut up. Like, let's do the thing I said. Yeah, and he also and he even, um, to he's, the, he even to, says what, like he's gonna save his own ass. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like, there's a scene that I remember hit me when I was a kid when I first saw this in the theater uh, when I was ten, or I might even been nine. Um, with what is it, Tommy and the the two sort of teenage characters? I can, from when I'm uh, Tommy and blanking Judy. on their names. <laughs> Tommy and Judy, you know, like Tommy, it's his uncle's house and his uncle's dead. And, you know, he's like, Uncle Reg was, uh, you know, doing over the house. And, and Dwayne Jones is like, yeah, well, it sucks. Like he said, when he punches the yeah. hole through the door, he's like, yeah, yeah well, it's no good. Yeah. And like, yeah, there's a scene, you know, and he beats Uncle Reg to death with the poker or Barbara does, I think. Um, yeah. But in yeah, the original Barbara. one, when they go upstairs and there's that like rotten lettuce head zombie at the top of the stairs uh Bosco Jones chocolate syrup <laughs> it. it's kind of yes yeah but he's kind of like oh you don't want to see this you know you don't want to see him like that and the tony yeah. todd character isn't like that at all he's like yeah just roll him up in a rug and toss him oh it's your uncle yeah get over it you know yeah he's 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 pretty gangster in this one 
Well, I think the kid even says, like, hey, what's going on up there? He's like, don't come up here. Like, yeah. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's not even, like, compassionate at all. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, oh, it's, good. He, he has no empathy for any of the other characters. I, I love that scene where uh, Patricia Tallman's beating the uh, the balloon of the uncle with the, <laughs> with the, with the fireplace poker. Yeah. <laughs> and you watch the head drop down about woman. five inches. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She I saw not, that in my... Uh, she didn't do much acting. Yeah, and I was doing my research. Yeah, she was like a that. creature performer. And it's something. Uh, There's my, one of my favorite. Sorry, go oh, ahead. Sorry, one of my favorite things that uh, it's in the commentary, Savini says at the beginning of the movie where she's running and she doesn't, she kicks her shoes off so she can run. There's a scene where the camera moves in and actually there's a, there's a PA just under the frame putting shoes on her so that she can <laughs> run over these rocks without shredding her feet, but they can do it in one shot. Cause if she didn't have shoes on, like she had to run across these sharp rocks. And now every <laughs> time crazy. I see that scene, like you can't really tell, but I'm, that's all I can think of. Yeah, it's the only thing you can think of now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's like the in Hellraiser the when they're pushing the engineer and you can see the guy pushing on the cart. Yeah, that's the that's the only thing you see from that point on is the guy like yeah, yeah pushing this thing on like a wheelchair or whatever. And until you learn that, you never see it. Yeah. And then now that's all you see. <laughs> that one I can justify. I'm like, oh, that's a lesser demon. That's just like yeah. doing the work. <laughs> yeah, like a blue collar <laughs> demon. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, it's the just health back. plan in hell is amazing. You get your own personal, you know, nurse. Like, yeah, he's just back there. It's a living. <laughs> you're like a Flintstones yeah. like dishwasher burn or something. <laughs> you're almost done, boss. I gotta, I gotta knock off. Yeah. Five. <laughs> About to be on overtime. <laughs> um, I know. Let's let's get into the rating on this. I um. Honestly, if this were like 15, 20 years ago, I would have given this movie like a straight out 10. Like, uh, really? Yeah, I, I was like, I loved this movie. Um, you know, watching it this time, I am way, way more critical. I also realized I haven't seen this movie in a very long time. Yeah. I used to, this is like a movie I would just put on like in like an, like an afternoon if I was like doing something and wanted something in the background. I would yeah. like fall asleep to this movie. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a long time since I've seen it. Um, I mean, on the, we'll do the, we'll do the movie scale and then the horror movie scale. Okay, we've been we've been like splitting it up uh, uh, recently. Um, I mean, as far as a movie, I mean, like pretty much you said it all at the beginning. It's a legal document. Yeah, it's you know it's it's not it's it's a no frills uh, kind of movie remake. Um, so I would say maybe like a five. You know, it's not it's not bad. It's not the greatest horror movie you've ever seen, but it, it's good for what it is. Um, me being a horror fan. Right now, I'm gonna give it like a seven five. I think. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for me, I think it, I'm not gonna break it up into the the movie scale horror movie scale because I think it it's gonna fall about the same spot for me. Yeah. It's like a six. I like I was entertained. Um, I didn't love a lot of the character choices or or um the dialogue. It, like it's a little a little hokey from time to time. Yeah. But it's got it's it's got a special charm. That kind of brings it above, you know, like mediocre. There, um, you're like the hokey dialogue. There's one scene. It's Tony Todd and um, Tom, the the younger kid, and, and it might even be Tom when Towles. they're when. Oh, Tom. Yeah, Tom. yeah, yeah, yeah. Not yeah, Tom, not Tom Towles. He's uh, he's Cooper. Um, I think it's when they're nailing the doors up, and he's like, "Oh, you know, I'm an idiot. I forgot that the you know the the better doors are downstairs." Yeah. And like Tony Todd's just like, yes, <laughs> he gives this weird, like super energetic, like really, like he's just, like, he just get a game show question or something. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very unusual uh, reaction. Like it's, it, it's as far as remakes go, I think expectations are always low with a remake. So which works in a yeah. remake's favor. Right. Um, and David Cronenberg as my favorite ever quote about remakes when he remade the fly they were like you must have loved this movie it was like your favorite movie and that's why you remade it and he went no it's a terrible movie <laughs> and they were like what and he goes well you don't remake a good movie you remake a movie that it's a good idea but was poorly executed that's why you yeah. remake a movie right yeah did, did so, i not just say the they, same thing like a couple of episodes ago you did yeah like yeah like that's why yeah. people get upset then, when you make sorry no sorry go ahead 
Oh no, but yeah, but that's why like the thing is an amazing remake. The blob is an amazing remake. Uh the fly, like they're they're really interesting ideas that were hampered by later time the time they were made, where they didn't reach their full potential, and when they are able to catch up with that, they're great. Yeah, it's why the remake of the thing is good, but the remake of the remake of the thing is not good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, they tried to remake a great movie. Yeah. And it just it fell f- way flat. Yeah, there's nothing you can add or improve upon. And for the original Night of the Living Dead, it's a fluke in that that movie works perfectly. Like, there's no fat on the movie. Um, there, There's no extraneous scenes. Uh, because it's so not necessarily gory, because they had to be, what you do see works really well. Um, and so when you're remaking it, you're not adding a lot to it. There's some twists. The characters are slightly different. Obviously the special effects look more modern, but there's more of them, which sort of almost takes me out of it a little bit. Um, And so it it feels like a long episode of tales from the crypt. It feels like a made for cable TV circa 1990, which isn't a bad thing, but it doesn't feel like a movie to me. It feels like a TV movie, like a made for TV movie. Yeah, it's very small. It has like a very and not in like a good, cozy, claustrophobic kind of way. Um, <laughs> and so it's it's good. But like to your point of the, the one I put on in the background or the one I put on to go to sleep, it's Day of the Dead. Always like that. There, I find that movie oddly comforting, uh, which the, is very strange because there's like Day of the Dead is actually my favorite cocksucker. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, yeah I, we we it's your favorite? Yeah. Day of the Dead is is absolutely my favorite of the Romero zombie movies. Yeah. Um I've always been a staunch Dawn of the Dead fan. <laughs> I won't take anything away from it. Dawn is amazing, but yeah. Day just has that like it's more claustrophobic than Dawn and the gore is more intense. Yeah, so, oh, yeah, like, yeah. There's this just like overpowering dread through all of Day. It's incre- It's weird because it's incredibly nihilistic, but it has the most hopeful ending, weirdly. Uh, but again, like Night, where, where Cooper is right, Rhodes is right. Yeah. That's the worst part of that movie, is if they yep. listen to Rhodes, who was just like, what the hell are we doing here? This is ridiculous. We should just shoot as many of them as we can, get the hell out of here. It's what we should have done from day one. <laughs> like... He's an asshole, but he's 100% correct. And that that's yep. a really weird, complicated thing where, you know, Romero is such an angry hippie at heart and so against the military, <laughs> um, clearly in that movie. And so to have to reconcile the fact that that guy's right, have to reconcile the fact that this racist asshole in the basement, Cooper, was right the whole time, it is a really complicated, uh, almost different kind of horror. <laughs> it's liberal horror pretty much like i have to admit you know like the guy with you know the the quote-unquote bad ideas was actually right about this yeah <laughs> it's it's he's always taken a very social standpoint in all of his movies really um where the horror is twofold so it's like the monster is horrifying and scary whatever but there's also all these social elements that are just as horrifying uh, not as obvious but once you start like digging into it it's terrible <laughs> and it, it gives you that that extra feeling of unease instead of just the monsters. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and Day also has that weird thing with like you almost you're he, he sort of walks into a false sense of uh sympathy for uh, Logan. Um but you're like, he's a fucking psycho. <laughs> like you're yeah. like, oh he's the doctor and he's the scientist. But then you're like, oh, this guy's completely crazy. Like, yeah. he's not a good guy. Um, no. And it, it, it's, it's hard to the, – the sort of plays of characters and the characters that we're seeing in horror movies, that movie especially really pulls the rug out from us uh, in that it, none of them end up being kind of like the cliche that we want them to be, which is disorienting. <laughs> yeah. Like, that makes you – um, whereas in, in the in the remake, he's pretty much exactly what they look like they are the moment they appear on screen. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty true. 
Uh, so before we go a whole lot further, Ken, what would you rate this movie? Uh, on a scale I would of one probably. To 10? I mean, I have. Some- I have some nostalgic love of this movie. Um, I revisit it relatively often, but uh, you know, like you, I, I, I've it's not it's not that it's worse, but I've gotten more of it as time has gone on. Um, yeah, and I, I'd probably give it a, a six, like a solid six, solid six and a half. Yeah, yeah, I think I rate it as high as I do because of the nostalgia factor. Like I, I watched this all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, this um, was a, like Rita Fangoria for months. Can't wait till it's out, kind of thing. You know, <laughs> it was really for a lot of people. It was the first zombie movie that we got to see in the theater, or to see as it came out. Like I ended up being, I just eked in and got my parents to take me to see Day of the Dead when I was five. Um, but <laughs> wow. That, you know, <laughs> This was the one, like, you could see this, you know? It was happening now. It wasn't an old movie. So there was some excitement there for them. Yeah, this is before we had zombies, like, crammed down our throat culturally. Yeah. Uh, before you had Walking Dead, you know, uh, like, four flavors of The Walking Dead on every week. And, and even, like, even before that, we were lucky enough to get Land of the Dead mm-hmm. before the, like, crazy zombie hype phenomenon happened. So, like, Land of the Dead, for me, was was like right at the midpoint of me and my love affair with zombies. So I like, I really got into them. Um, you know, I would look for the, the old crazy ones like, uh, Lucio Fulci's zombie. Yeah. Uh, things like that. Yeah. And wind up watching all the like really old trashy zombie movies before you find the, the ones that are really good. And then something like land of the dead comes out, which was, um, actually, you know what? I think Shaun of the Dead came out before Land of the Dead, which helped kind of kickstart a, a lot of that. Yeah, so yeah. Shaun of the Dead was 98, and I think Land of the Dead was 99, if I'm not mistaken. No, 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 no. they were both. Oh, no, Shaun of the Dead was, was really? 2003. Land of the Dead was 2004. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. I'm usually pretty good on my movie years. <laughs> but <laughs> I, th- I think those two together, so you had this like really cool kind of independent uh, zombie movie that, with this amazing twist. Um came out and got everybody's like mouth watering for zombies. And then Romero comes back with land of the dead, which a lot of people don't like. I found it to be enjoyable. Yeah. Um, that was, that movie was simmering for a long time too. I remember yeah. hearing about that for years. Like at one point it was called dead reckoning. Yeah. It went, it went through yeah. production hell. Yeah. 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 Um, oh yeah. His script. I think he wrote for that in 91 or 92. Yeah. Cause I think Romero wrote, the script that wound up being in this 1990 remake as well. Um, and then he started working on uh, what he called Dead Reckoning at the time. Um, but going back to when Land of the Dead comes out, it's... I remember it being, like, all over the place. Like, it, it, I don't think it did well uh, in the box office, but I think it got people really hungry for, like, more intense... <laughs> Yeah, popular I, zombie movies. I, now that I now that I recall, I was working at the video store at the time. So yeah, it, uh, it wasn't that time frame, and, and that was like a thing. Like I remember me and a couple of the guys from the video store, like we're going to go see this movie. You know, yeah, it's Romero. Like it's the first like kind of zombie movie in a while. Like, yeah, I was pumped yeah. when that came out. Yeah. Well, because it was it was sort of in legend. Romero had, even though I don't think he had, but he had been screwed over of his of his vision, and famously, you know, Day of the Dead was supposed to be this big finale and the original script i actually don't care for i think that the one he made is a lot better his original script is basically about uh human warlords using armies of the dead to fight proxy wars in this island and uh, it was way too on the nose kind of like vietnam and it just it, it, it didn't resonate with me as much as what he ended up making and what he ended up making he ended up making because he couldn't do that movie and he had to rethink it. And so land of the dead was kind of like, Hey, you guys want Romero to be able to make exactly the zombie movie he wants with the budget he wants. Here it is. Like, this is like unfiltered Romero's zombie. And so high expectations. So I was slightly disappointed when I first saw it, but in hindsight, I, I, it, it, it holds up pretty well because I, I think that his themes of where this thing goes, um, where 
Day of the Dead was about ignoring the problem until it got so bad there's nothing we can do about it anymore. And Land of the Dead takes that even further in that rich people feel like they can buy their way out of anything. And it resonates yeah. so much more now where they're like, we don't care about COVID. We don't care about climate change. We're rich. We can, we'll just move to space or we'll have bunkers or yeah. whatever it is. I'm going to live on you the moon. You guys yeah. have to deal with it. Yeah. And it, that really is hammered home in that land of the dead movie. And it, it, it almost has gotten better with time. I feel like than it, when it originally came out. Yeah, I got to revisit that movie. I haven't seen that in a very long time either. Yeah. Yep. All right. So I think right now we're going to go to our IMDb trivia segment um, where we talk about uh, all kinds of stupid trivia that I pull off IMDb. <laughs> Whether it's accurate or not, we're going to talk about it. We'll leave that to the folks at IMDb to decide. Yeah. <laughs> the well researched IMDb. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what can go wrong when you ask everybody to submit facts? <laughs> <laughs> Crowdsourcing is always reliable. Not to bother you with trivia. I used to think they were kind of trivia. Yeah. <laughs> it's the best way to get quality. So... Tom Savini originally wanted to start the film in black and white and slowly add color, which would be a weird kind of artistic statement. Yeah. I mean, he, he actually do kind of do it uh, in the very beginning of the movie. It, it's maybe like a 30 second, like they're showing the moon and then it kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the clouds and the moon. Yeah. yeah. When the credits so that's rolling. that's black and white and then it's in color. But from the sound of this. uh he would have had like whole scenes that were in black and white. Like I think the graveyard scene being in black and white with Bill Mosley, like would have been cool um, as, as just, you know, uh, a rehash of the original, maybe just kind of plant it. Yeah. But, but I feel like that would have taken you out of it so much. It would have made it made you so aware that you're watching not only a movie, but a remake of a very specific movie. And it would have come across yeah. like more of a homage to wizard of Oz than to the original movie. Oh, yeah. 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 You get those sippy of zombies. <laughs> uh, the Magruder zombie was a man that director Tom Zavini saw in a diner and told him that he would make a great zombie, and the man agreed. So he showed up to uh, all of the premieres, at, like, dressed as a zombie. <laughs> Is this the guy who looks kind of like Tom Waits? He's got, like, the gray, like, hair. I think he's just wearing, like, a kind of like a dress shirt and slacks. Uh, I think so. He's one of the... I think he's the one that shows up later in the movie. I think she said it's Mr. You, Magruder. You shot Mr. Magruder! Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Tom Savini pushed hard for the producers uh, to make Barbara the survivor and an action heroine. So I don't know why he would really have to push that hard unless they wanted to keep like the original like ending. A straight remake, yeah. Which, uh, I mean, still could work, but it wouldn't be as... Tom Savini ish, yeah. you know what I mean? I, I think Savini, especially at that time, was a little invested in building his own legend. Uh, and yeah. yeah, Savini didn't do anything on this movie that George Romero didn't either okay beforehand or tell him to do. Like, he was more of a higher yeah. hand here, and they threw him a bone, um, just like uh, Tom, is it Tom Harris, uh, who directed Creepshow 2, who had done the music for. for Day of the Dead. Um, it, it was more throwing him a bone. I don't. This was not like. So I've I've seen interviews with Savini in the '90s um, when he's very much like I fought for this. So this was my movie and my like because he was really trying to angle himself yeah. as like an auteur director. And it's like, nah, it's okay that that was not Settle the case down, here. Man. Yeah. You, yeah, you're the makeup guy and an okay actor. Like, <laughs> yeah, like and you've known. <laughs> Calm these down, sex machine. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like, you're not fighting for anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, the character of Tom, played by William Butler, wears a t-shirt with the Iron City beer logo on the front. Uh, this is the same drink consumed in the original Dawn of the Dead uh, by the Redneck Militia and is also the same brand of beer that George Romero's production company uh, had produced a commercial for during their early years. So that's cool. Yeah, like he's throwing it back to a, a brand that 
yeah, really helped him start off. Yeah, I believe the commercial they made for that beer company was like a play on Fantastic Voyage, where they shrink down uh, when they did their oh, original really? production of commercials <laughs> in the 60s. Yeah. Oof. <laughs> That's, That's not nice. great. <laughs> <laughs> now, the original, I mean, if you look at the original uh, latent image or image 10 um, production company commercials, they're pretty lame. Um, and then Romero, of course, did a bunch of the shorts for Mr. Rogers. Yeah, so he did a bunch of work for Mr. Rogers. Did he really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah Mr. Yeah, Rogers like, went Pittsburgh. to like, the premieres of all his movies. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, he was... You know how in Mr. Rogers, <laughs> when they'd be like, we're going to the crayon factory, and they'd show the little documentary film, or like... It would... Yeah. Romero shot all those. No yeah. kidding. <laughs> yeah, it was Pittsburgh. I mean, they're what Pittsburgh... I... The, the Pittsburgh production scene was pretty small. Yeah, yeah, actually, it's not that big of a city. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, the, okay, this one's kind of a long one. So the characters take refuge in an isolated farmhouse early in the film. Next to one of the doors, visible in shots of the exterior of the house, is the name of the owner, M. Celeste, in nail-on uh, letters in a script font. Uh, this seems to be homage to the sailing ship Mary Celeste, which was discovered in the Atlantic Ocean, unmanned and under sail heading toward the Strait of Gibraltar in 1872. The crew was not on board, and the only lifeboat was gone, but the ship had no damage and was seaworthy. Like the ship, the house was relatively undamaged by the ordeal and could have been immediately occupied. According to Tom Savini's commentary on the DVD, the name is deliberate reference to the state of the house. Huh. Which is some deep cut shit. Yeah, so that's a very deep cut reference. I was wondering why, because that that sign is like very prominent in a lot of scenes. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know if it was maybe like an homage to that's like so... somebody they knew or what. <laughs> that's so wanky. Like it might as well have been a tribute to Mama Celeste Pizza. Like it was just like that's such someone who's like that would have been much trying... more believable. <laughs> so... Yeah, like, you're just trying so hard to add, like, subtext and some artsy stuff there that doesn't, like, come on. <laughs> if it's if it's true, it's like, completely I, unnecessary. Yeah, like, I would rather have, like, a, oh, we wrote the, you know, the Key Grips name here because we thought it was funny and he's a good guy. Like, yeah. that stuff yeah. is way more, like, uh... I just have way more of, of an affinity for that than rather like, oh, this is a homo. This is from Dante's Inferno or like, yeah. so, like come on, man. I, yep. I, I was going to say, I'm not above like angling a joke at like a certain subset of people, but who is going to be like, oh my God, that's the Mary <laughs> Celeste. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> History. I hate, I yeah, hate yeah. to admit this and this will sound like, yeah, this will sound like garbage, but I did get that reference when I saw it. <laughs> It was kind of like, nah. thanks, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> uh, despite the fact that the filming was going smoothly and on time and on budget, uh, Menaheim Golan and the film's other producers insisted on cutting out other scenes and events to keep the cost down. As a first time director, Tom Savini could do little to stop them. <laughs> but he fought for so much. Yeah. Yeah. You're a figure. Menachem Golan. <laughs> Menachem is infamous for just fucking up movies. Uh, I mean, I don't know if you know anything about him, but he founded Canon Pictures and was an absolute oh, yeah. maniac. Uh, the people there's who gave two different Superman documentaries. Of... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Um, and whenever he would get involved in a movie, it was always bad news. <laughs> Was he one of those guys who just like he didn't really know anything, but he liked to swing his dick around? No, he was this he's this guy from Israel who is obsessed with movies and just didn't care how much they cost. He just wants to make them and have them be these visions, but he's just not good at it. Oh. Uh, and so that you know, it just it has bizarre ideas. Um, there, there's a whole movie called Electric Boogaloo, the story of Canon Pictures, and uh, Jesus yeah. Christ! Uh, if I that. if I don't just tell you to watch it, I'll end up recounting every story in it. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's just like it's involved, and it never makes anything better. But that being said, 
I can't really see any places in this remake that there's like obvious things cut. There's nothing missing here that I feel like is lack. You definitely will see movies sometimes. Where you're, are we missing a reel? Like what? What? There's stuff yeah, happened that, that I don't story, hard to get here. Uh, this doesn't have that. So he might have made a good call if there was all this extraneous stuff. Like if if they wanted to add stuff that wasn't in the original or put in all this other stuff i don't think it would have been good i want to say they actually had to cut a lot of gore out of this movie because well that would have uh, been the expensive stuff probably it, yeah, yeah initially cut. initially i think it had like an nc-17 rating um and then they had it to was, cut it, it was cut it back it was released on video as an unrated cut i believe um which i think was always the intention but they definitely cut stuff out to get the r rating for the theatrical which yeah i i, I believe it yeah. Uh, oh, this is the Magruder scene, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, we always have the movie playing. Uh, uh, oh, nice. Doing this. He was very Tom Waitsian. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, that guy. Yeah. Yeah, I expected him to ask for, like, brains, two pieces of pie, and a cup of coffee. <laughs> like, ten cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, see. actually, that reminds me the the opening sort of bait and switch in this is pretty good. Where you see that very in the scene with Johnny, you see that very slow moving oh. zombie, and you're like, oh, that's the one that's going to attack him. And then out of nowhere, this really gruesome one hits in, and that's the kind of thing yeah. where you're sort of rewarded with a scare for being familiar with the other one. Yeah, I always, I always kind of thought that was supposed to be like a a nod to the original, where like that guy looks like that first zombie. Where yeah, he's just like a pale dude with like wispy, like white hair. Yeah, he just had a head wound. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah, oh, I'm sorry, and then like yeah. he just gets sideswiped by that one with the screwed up face. Uh, the special effects team intentionally kept the effects restrained, which I guess. Yeah. I guess they did, yeah. Sure. <laughs> uh, as they felt that excessive gore would be disrespectful to the original film. See, that counter that contradicts earlier IMDb facts that I found but left out, <laughs> that I referenced. Now I look like an asshole. Uh, 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 to keep the effects realistic, though, they used an inspiration... Uh, they used real autopsy and forensic pathology textbooks and Nazi death camp footage, which Tom Savini will tell you at any given point, if he has a microphone in his hand, he will tell you that he was in Vietnam and he was a combat photographer and he's the only guy that has seen the real thing. And I'm kind of tired of hearing it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Especially when you look at like reanimator, which to me is the first sort of, zombie movie that kind of in day but same year that that kind of gets that medical part like that stuff looks yeah. pretty real it's anatomically correct yeah the Even colors the, uh, are the, the weird things that happen yeah yeah the zombie at the beginning is like he has scars like he would if he were embalmed and like prepared for a funeral he has like the cut down the middle like yeah yeah yeah, his yep. ass is hanging out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, dead ass. That's where your rating yeah. came in. Oh boy, <laughs> that's what. I'm, yep. <laughs> oh, uh, the film is included on Roger Ebert's most hated list uh, because he felt that Romero had just made the same movie a second time, which he didn't do. And Ebert is a fucking douchebag. <laughs> I don't know. See, Ebert loved the original. He loved the original and gave it a really good review and saw it on a matinee filled with children. And his original, <laughs> oh his original review of night is really worth reading. And he was a champion for that movie. So I, I kind of am with him on that because the one thing he really hated was unoriginality or like, what's the point of this? <laughs> yeah. But he also had a hard on for just disrespecting any kind of horror movie for the most part. And in a lot of the more reviews Siskel. that I've seen. Siskel was, S oh, was, Siskel it Siskel? was more yeah. guilty. Siskel was the guy who gave out Betsy Palmer's home address and told people to go annoy her because she was in Friday the 13th and he hated yes, all the slasher yes. movies. But Ebert was, was actually pretty uh, 
if it's a good, I mean, he's harsh, but if it was a good movie, like he loved people under the stairs, um, you know, he gave, good, I must've had him backwards to then. A, yeah. He gave good, a lot of movies. You would be surprised by. There's a lot of movies that uh, people have uploaded, like every Siskel and Ebert on YouTube, which are really fun to go down that rabbit hole to the point where there are people who've done like super cuts of all their reviews of horror movies. Um, and there are movies that I, that I have nostalgic love for that, I, I've watched the review and frankly had to be like, nah, they're right. <laughs> <laughs> You're just like, this movie's just a dumb, violent for no, you know, and, and the thing I love too is they would go see those movies in the really sleazy, filthy theaters that you had to see those movies in. It was the only place to see them. Yeah. <laughs> just to read these reviews, which gave me like a weird respect. <laughs> they were in the shit man well i want to i want to see the last time we referenced them on the show is i think they had they had poo-pooed on candy man yes yeah yeah i remember talking about and that. i took that personally <laughs> <laughs> yeah although the, the the review is interesting because a lot of times yeah siskel's read on candy man was just stupid like it, he's wrong uh but yeah. ebert is is almost wants to give it a thumbs up and has some issues with it that I'll be like, I don't agree with that, but I could see that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Agree to disagree, I guess. <laughs> uh, let's see. What else we got here? Oh, uh, when Sarah bites her mother, Helen on the neck, blood splatters on the garden trowel hanging on the wall, which is a reference to the original night of the living dead in which the daughter kills yeah. the mother with a garden trowel. Her, yeah. So I, those are those are the kind of things that I like. So you're going to do this different, but we're going to reference the original. So you've got, you know, a, a little bit of the best of both worlds. So you have that original aspect and then giving respect to the original. There's a really great one of those in Day of the Dead uh, when Bob um, salutes Rhodes in the, the score. Yeah. They play the gonk from Dawn. <laughs> It's great. It's, it's like oh, this very yeah. subtle musical cue. Uh, those are yeah. the kind of things that you're like, oh, yeah. Yeah, there it is. That's the one. <laughs> uh, uh, despite the obvious danger in the, in the story being zombies outside of the house, uh, not a single main character is killed by them. Two are shot, two are blown up, one survives, and one is killed by his, the zombie daughter inside the house. Yeah, I never noticed that. Yeah. Huh. Which so again like they shows did, you that they did themselves in. Yeah, Ben was wrong. Like holding up in this house it was was the wrong move. Yeah, it was a bad idea. Um, but that is it for IMDb trivia. All right. Well, uh yeah, I was just going to say, like, we, we talk about this in, in Return of the Living Dead, too. Basically, they all die because they keep making the same bad decisions. Instead of getting out of there, they, you know, getting out of there, they, like, they further... Oh, it's, that's the, the opposite. They further entrench, whereas in this one, they should have further entrenched. Yeah. Huh. Anyway, that was a garbled point. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like... Okay. It's yeah, like sure, yeah. To, it's like... Yeah, it's... It's like going to a mid-level. It's like going to a TGI Fridays, right? Really, what you'd have done was either spend more money and go to a better restaurant, or spend less money and get like a nice sub. You know, like yeah. <laughs> you've gone middle of the road and, and you spent more than you should have for stuff that's not that great. You've compromised, and nobody's happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should have yeah. either gone all the way into the basement or gotten the hell out of there. <laughs> yeah, today's today's discount is tomorrow's diarrhea. <laughs> Exactly. You just rented oh, it. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on to the uh, the better known as segment of the show. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we will start off with Tony Todd, who we have gone off uh, on you know at length before when we did Candyman. I, I personally love Tony Todd as an actor um, and as a human. Uh, I've, you know, I uh, did an interview with him at a con a few years ago. Um, and just one of the best people I've had a, you know, a chance to like work with over the years. Um, again, this Tony Todd is everywhere. Like I guarantee you, you've seen a movie with Tony Todd if you don't know his name. Yeah. Um, I've never met him, but I'd love to shake his dick. <laughs> He's very tall. All right. Yeah. <laughs> it would be right there. <laughs> 
weird Although flex, I, but okay. Ken, Ken Foray is bigger than him. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah. Tony Todd's what, 6'6"? Six, six? No, he's not taller than me. Yeah, he's like 6'1", I'd say, maybe 6'2". Yeah. No. Yeah, 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 yeah no, he's... He, uh, He's yeah. not. He, I again. I've met the guy. Then they have. Than then they have lied yeah. on some he's, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's big for an actor. He's big for an actor. Oh, is that like, what yeah. it is? Taller than Tom Cruise. Actors are. Well, Tom Savini's like yeah, five five. Yeah. Oh, who was it? Was it James Gunn? Just went off about actors lying about their heights. Oh, I missed that. Yeah. Yeah, because like he he'll like oh yeah well he'll, he'll try to frame something with certain heights and and whatever in frame but then if your guy says he's six one but he's he's five nine you got to put him on an apple crate <laughs> yeah the um, one that always gets me is and I, i've mentioned this all the time but lance hendrickson who's such a great heavy and such a great villain he's like five six maybe what <laughs> see like yeah. my whole so life like i Cold... never thought i was that tall but i'm six three yeah. my my whole like family Cold... is like six feet tall yeah, same. I'm the same that I do. And like in like Stone Cold, he's against uh Frank Bosworth, who's like six three, and they're like eye to yeah. eye. So when I see that movie now, I'm like Hendrickson's on like seven apple boxes or yeah. like near dark, because uh, you know Bill Paxton was a big guy. So he's like, you know, just knowing he's standing in on a bunch of crates. <laughs> real real tall inserts on the in the shoes. Yeah. Some low level grip, like you know, on all fours, he's <laughs> just standing on his back. <laughs> Again, it's a living. Yeah. <laughs> I've also seen I've also seen people when they talk about this movie talk about how it's almost like a um like a super, super group of horror character actors, but aside from Bill Mosley, who had been in Text Chainsaw Massacre 2 a few years before that, none of these people made the horror films they were known for until after this. So Candyman was what, 92? Uh, yeah, Henry Portrait Tom of a Serial Towles Killer. I think he corpses. Yeah, that's but he was in Henry this. Portrait of a Serial Killer uh, as Otis, oh, yeah, but yeah. that didn't come out. Uh, they shot it, I think, in 88 or 89, but that didn't come out till 90, 91. Um, yeah. So it's, it's familiar faces, but it's like, no, they didn't cast Candyman and Otis from Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer in this. <laughs> They could have been, you know, that's total happenstance. Yeah, I think this is actually Tony Todd's first horror movie. Uh, it might yeah. Have been, oh, sorry, I'm scrolling back through it. Um, the reason I, I – we've gone over his his resume before. Um, this is the reason I'm bringing him up is um, – Ken, you might be interested to hear this, like, fact that we've discovered. We are, like, 21 episodes into the show right now. Yeah. And over those 21 episodes, I think there's been three episodes – where we have done a movie and there has not been one actor, at least one actor who did a role on murder. She wrote every single, almost every <laughs> single movie has one yeah. actor who's been on murder. She wrote. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. think, Especially I think it might New be York four. Cause they would pull from New York theater. Yeah. They yeah, would pull yeah. from New York theater big time for that. And that um, was Tony and, Todd uh, was a big, big theater guy. Yeah, I was gonna say he's our he's our uh, murder she wrote guy for this week. Oh, is he really? Yeah, I had to bring him up again because yeah. Other than that, we have no other murder she wrote actors. Oh, that's upsetting. Time. Yeah, <laughs> I thought for sure we'd get at least one other person, but no. Uh, but yeah, that's gonna be our podcast within the podcast coming soon. Monster she wrote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving on to uh, Patricia Tallman, uh, we mentioned her before. Uh, she did a lot of stunt work. Um, she has been in a, uh, she's been in a lot of stuff, um, going back, uh, to early eighties, um, Tales from the Dark Side. That's another show that comes up a lot, uh, as far as like horror movies. Yeah. Cause it's all know, the, actors do a lot. All, yeah. That's again, all New York actors. They shot it in Pittsburgh cause it's the whole Romero crew. I think Patty Tillman's first movie might even be Knight Riders, the Romero Savini movie. Yeah, it is. 1981. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's also in Monkey Shines. That's a Romero movie too, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she was in Roadhouse. Not a Romero movie, but. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing stunts. She's apparently Doing just stunts. some like. Yeah. Her credit is Bandstand Babe. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, she was on the yeah, uh, she, the Flash I, 90s I, TV show. She's a creature in the Uninvited. Uh, oh, yeah. The three. Sorry, I'm going through. I don't know. Uh, she, she was, was a creature in. Uh, she was the witch in Army of Darkness. Yeah. 
Um, yes, and I think she might. Then it might have been um, the Tommy Knockers or something. She's definitely like a full body creature suit and something. She had a lot of like Babylon Five stuff. It looks oh, like. hold on, she was in a bunch of Deep Space Nine. Go to... uh, yep. Yeah. Oh, she, yeah. She was probably a bunch of uh, aliens. Yeah. Oh, and Voyager too. So awesome. Um, are you are you a Star Trek guy? I no. But since I've been doing my show, I've I've had to interview like a ton of cast members, so I've gone back and rewatched everything and to yeah. like crash courses and I, I do an appreciation for it that I didn't have previously. Was it that you just never got into it or you just didn't like it? I well I I like the 60sness of the original show, but it was super cheesy. Um, Next Generation was a real tough for me because it was, I was so into like dystopian sci fi and horror. It's so utopian and hopeful. Oh, yeah. Uh, especially the first couple of seasons like, where the board comes in. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's just, it's, <laughs> well, so it was like boring to me. Well, that's why, uh, that's why Deep Space Nine is so good because it's such a turnaround from Next Gen. It's, it's the darkest of the Star Treks. Yeah, it's it's really good. I I've talked about this before. I have a I real up, like love hate. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Also, it was, I think I ended up liking Voyager the most, um, because it had sort of some of the more interesting like character yeah. dynamics and some of the more sad uh, backstories. Uh, like Seven and Nine was such a um, like a pinup at the time, but when I watch that show jerry ryan does some really good emotional acting of like that character's backstory um and then of course uh uh robert picardo is gonna be good oh yeah he's, he's, he's so good <laughs> as the doctor <laughs> um but yeah i, I have a love-hate relationship with star trek because like, i got dragged to all of those movies when i was a kid um and like it's a mixed bag like some of them are really good some of them are not so good <laughs> So yeah, it was like it was a thing that was like forced on me, and like I just, it, as I got older, I kind of got into it. I just oh, for the longest time resisted <laughs> it so much. Uh, anyway, I think it was the humanoid aliens that bothered me too, because I wanted like xenomorph aliens or like predators, you know. I wanted like alien yeah. deadly spawn <laughs> kind of aliens. Yeah, <laughs> like I can tell that's just a dude in makeup. Like I want like a, <laughs> I want a cool looking like monster. <laughs> yeah, I want this to be about diplomatic paperwork. <laughs> uh moving on to uh to tom towels um he was in a lot of stuff that i just did not remember um he started off actually in dog day afternoon that was his first movie that's a great movie yeah i haven't seen that movie in a very long time um he was in the first er series not the um not the 90s one uh, the first one with also that also had george clooney in it actually the 80s like hospital yeah that one with, like elliot gould that one has some horror connections because there was um, uh, Stuart Gordon's experimental theater company in Chicago. Um, they originated that ER. That was a stage play in that theater. And um, the woman who plays the, the um, not the secretary, but like the, the woman at the front counter of the hospital, she was in the stage. Yeah. She's originally from that theater company. And um, that was Stuart Gordon's theater company. And so that, that TV, that sitcom came out of the same exact place from the same people as reanimator that's marvelous that's weird yeah. i love that <laughs> um we mentioned henry uh portrait of a serial killer he was in that tom tells that's a great movie i i still have never seen that it's very intense yeah like yeah it's, it's one of those ones where you like you kind of feel uncomfortable the whole way through yeah and regardless of anything that's actually happening, like on screen violence, just the the way his character is presented and how he interacts with everybody, it's just very disturbing. It it does that thing too that I I think we're missing our serial killer stuff where they are definitely not lionized. They are dumb, vile humans who probably should have been put down like they're yeah. not these like master villain conniving or like oh he's so handsome and charming and he's got a plan and there's clues and like it's like no yeah. these are just like dirt bags yeah it's it's a scumbag on the road killing people which actually um that that real guy there's only actual proof that he killed two people 
and and lied about killing about yeah. eighty more people. Yeah, I guess I started just reading that well, not that long ago. Yeah, the police basically were like, "Hey, get the files of the unsolved stuff. We'll get this guy with a forty-two IQ to confess to them all, and then we can say we yeah, solved them." He wanted attention and cheeseburgers, and that's exactly what he got. So, yeah, it's whatever. Um, let's see. He did a stint on NYPD Blue, which I, I I watched that show when it was on. I could not tell you anything about that show at this point. <laughs> it's just yeah, gone. It was just generic cop show. Yeah. And they showed butts every now and again. Yep. Yeah, but none of the ones you wanted to see. Ones. I was going to say that, yeah. Unless you're really into Dennis Franz, yeah. then hey. Yeah, yeah. who doesn't want to get a glimpse of Dennis Franz's ass? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, 10-year-old me definitely did not want to see <laughs> Dennis Franz's ass. Tom Towles was also in the, year old the well. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm okay with it now. Yeah. I'm good with it. It's whatever. <laughs> Uh, he was also in the better known ER too, so he uh, he uh, crossed over to uh, you know covered both of those shows. Moving on up, yeah, as well as Pacific Blue, which gets mentioned on the <laughs> show a lot for some reason, uh, just because it was one of those like USA shows that was just kind of on in the nineties. That's the bike cops. I think it's like Baywatch with bike cops. Yeah, yeah. it certainly is. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. I I mentioned he was in House of a Thousand Corpses. He's also in um, uh, Devil's Rejects. Um, you know, the, uh, the Rob Zombie trilogy there. Yep. Um, you know, say what you will about those. Like, I, I like the first two, the third one I thought was just like a, he was trying to be, um, uh, what's Desperado there, his director. Oh, Robert, Robert Rodriguez. Rodriguez. Yeah. I, I felt like he Robert was Robert Rodriguez. Yeah. yeah. Well, even Robert Rodriguez couldn't finish his trilogy well. Yeah. 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 Once Upon a Time in Mexico is a. It's a movie. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see. And he was also, uh, the last kind of biggest thing he was in was in the, um, the Halloween remake, also the Rob Zombie one, which, yeah. Yeah. Once Rob Zombie gets you yeah. as an actor, he hangs on to you. Well, cause that's just, that's the case of him having a boner for people. He liked movies he watched growing up and he basically is just like, I want to meet them. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, that's, that's why he got Malcolm McDowell to be in, in his Halloween movies. Cause he loved a clockwork yeah. orange so much and bill mosley and karen black and sid hey yeah. it's like who's who of like 70s tv <laughs> it's a, yeah pretty much it, yeah it's all the the tv that he grew up watching and he decided well i can work with these people now so i don't blame him for that i blame him for putting his wife in everything yeah but <laughs> to the point where it's becoming yeah. a meme yeah 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 I'm like, oh, oh, everything's white trash and bleached out. Oh, okay, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I would be so much more excited for the monsters if if he didn't cast his wife as Lily. Yeah, like, you know, I, I don't know, like, I, not not a, a slight against her, you know. I, I just come on, like, just she's, well, she's not a great actress. Yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't she's passable. No. She's passable. Yeah. She's as good an actress as he is a musician. <laughs> Are we talking? His music before 2003, because <laughs> anything uh, after that is is right in the toilet. But yeah, I'll let you decide what I meant by that. <laughs> Do you their own? <laughs> I'm a massive white zombie fan. <laughs> There's a marked difference in his uh, musical directions. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I, I feel like once he went solo, he kind of veered into like novelty song territory. He had he had two great albums when he went solo, <laughs> and then that was it. He went, you, you know, you know, ministry song, Jesus built my hot rod. Can I do a <laughs> sillier version of that? <laughs> Can that be my career? Yeah. <laughs> and then, like, because he wrote a song Perfect. about the monsters car, he's now directing the monsters <laughs> movie. Like, God damn it! Yep. <laughs> oh, um. Moving on. Uh, Fun he, fact yeah. about him: he is from he is from Haverhill, Mass, which is the town that the creator of Archie is from, and is the town Riverdale is based on. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah, and then he went, and then he moved to New York City to be homeless and whatever, <laughs> and oh, work well, on Pee Wee's like Rob Zombie's Riverdale. Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, he was uh, like a PA on that, wasn't he, or something? Yeah, he was like a, 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 a art production assistant. Yeah, on the first season. Yeah. Um, moving on to McKee Anderson, she played Mrs. Cooper. 
Um, she really wasn't in a whole lot of stuff. Um, this was kind of the last notable thing she was in. Um, very, How dare yeah, you? Let me skip over uh, Operation Delta Force 3. Yeah, <laughs> like that, <laughs> that giant gem. Um, but she had a couple like notable TV spots. Um, uh, she was on The White Shadow for an episode, it looks like. She was on Chips, uh, Cagney and Lacey. Um, and then Night of the Living Dead and kind of not much after that. And then she's been in like a couple of things recently. She had a real big break after like 98 and then her next credit is 2016. Yeah. It's just like she does one thing every eight years. Yeah. <laughs> Living off like, that sweet Night of the Living like Dead a, remake money. It's like a Pennywise kind of situation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when she, she gets thirsty for blood and then she needs to come out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, let's see moving on william butler who is tom um this dude has kind of a weird uh, career i noticed he's in a lot of like stuff you've never heard of like kind of like horror stuff and then out of nowhere he had like a stint at disney he had did like 35 episodes of a show called disney get connected which i have never heard of uh although i'm pretty sure i'm out of the demographic for that <laughs> one um ginger dead man three the uh Another like horror classic, I guess. Yeah. Oh, oh, do you know who does the voice Charles of the Band. Ginger Dead Man? <laughs> it's Gary Busey. Gary Busey. Yeah. Oh, oh man. Yeah. Um, but he did that. Gary Busey, Disney whose on. brains literally, literally have been outside of his head. <laughs> yeah. That, that's <laughs> they had to be scooped up off of a curb and yeah, <laughs> like jammed back into his skull. Do you? Do I have time for a Gary Busey side note? Oh, there's yes. always time for a Gary Busey <laughs> side note. <laughs> Curtis Armstrong has the greatest Gary Busey story ever. And uh, I like where this is so going Curtis, already. <laughs> was, yeah, so Curtis got kind of talked into doing this Christian movie, and Gary Busey was in it, and the director was some born-again guy. And so they're shooting this scene that's supposed to take place in heaven, and Gary Busey comes into the scene, and he looks around, and he goes, no, nah, no, nah, not doing it. And they're like, what's, what's the problem? And he goes, I've been to heaven heaven doesn't look like this they don't have those kind of lights and they wouldn't have that couch <laughs> and then the direct which is crazy enough right so then the director goes hey i died and went to heaven and this is exactly the coach they had and this is exactly what it looked like because this guy also had had some kind of near-death thing and thinks he went to heaven so him and gary Busey get in this argument about like what kind of couches they have in heaven and like almost come to blows and then one of the extras is like i died twice once in vietnam and i was stabbed in new york and they had this couch but not those lights and so all three of them <laughs> get into like a physical fight about this and they had to shut down shooting for the day and curtis just goes absolute lunatics <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. Well, yeah, and I think Busey's whole thing with, like, religion was, I think he got some after that crazy accident, but yeah. then he got more yeah. from AA. <laughs> yeah. A double dose of religious insanity. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I William Butler, out of nowhere, sorry, going back to him, on, like, three Disney series, and then, like, a bunch of no-name horror movies. Um, moving on, Katie Finner, and she played Judy. She looked really familiar to me. Um, she, if anybody has seen, uh, Brockmire, that was on IFC a couple of years ago, um, starring Hank Azaria, where he's like a, he's like a baseball announcer. Okay. It was on for like three seasons. I think it's a pretty funny, like, Disgraced uh, series. Disgraced baseball I, announcer. Yes. Yeah. He has like a, in the first episode, like he has like a meltdown while he's like calling a game and like he gets fired and it's like, you know, it picks up a couple of years later. He's like completely like washed up. He's like a drunk, like yeah. announcing like the lowest of the lowest games, like AAA games, like, you know. Um, and then, and like, it, you know, it starts off about a comedy as baseball. And then by the third season, it's this weird comedy in the future, like this dystopian future where, like, Alexa has taken over the world. What? It's a really weird show, but it's really funny. All right. Yeah. I'll take your word for it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just like a very, like, it's just a very, like, just progresses very slowly. Like, you see, like, yo, we've got this thing. It's called The Moan. And it's like an Alexa thing. And it's like, you know, like, oh, Lamone's telling me I can't do this. I can't, like, it just picks up slowly throughout the season until they're in this dystopian future where Lamone rules everything. Ugh. <laughs> That's how it'll happen. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't like shows that are like that spot on. Like, that's our <laughs> imminent future. <laughs> yeah. 
this is so on it stops being funny <laughs> like um another kind of uh phenomenon that we've noticed with uh horror movies there's always one actor who like manages to just absolutely murder it with like one off tv roles um and uh she's uh, the, she's the person who did that this week it looks like Katie Finner and um this was her first movie Night of the Living Dead 1990 um after that, she was on Sex in the City. She's in the movie You've Got Mail. She's in All My Children, Frasier. Um, she's in the movie Liberty Heights. I don't know if I've ever seen that one. That one's kind of obscure with um, Adrian Brody. I think he's like living in Baltimore in like the 50s or 60s. It's kind of like a coming of age, like racism like tale. Never even heard of it. It wasn't bad. I, I saw that like when it was in the theater a long time ago. Um, sorry, a weird diversion. <laughs> uh, sorry, she was on Oz. She was in the movie Death to Smoochie. Um, uh, Wonder Falls, Miss Congeniality 2. Oh, uh, great. Yeah, but which she's seen a lot of stuff that like, you know, just I I know I've seen a little bit of. Um she's just one of those people who's just everywhere. I hate my teenage daughter, um, the Michael J. Fox show, Elementary, Murphy Brown, the reboot, uh the Woof. Good Fight. Yeah. Uh Brockmeyer, like I mean, she was in the movie Freaky too, which I, I actually really enjoyed. That was out last year. Um it's like a I think it's like a Blumhouse take on Freaky Friday with Vince Vaughn. Oh, and, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cassie Newton, like the younger, like she's like, a, I think she's Ant uh, Man's daughter in the Marvel movies. Um, have you seen The Good anyway, Fight, by the way? I have not, no. That's the, that's the one, is, that's the spinoff of The Good Wife, right? Yes, and it is unbelievably good. So the kings who created that show and The Good Wife and Evil, which everyone should be watching, uh, they I actually keep hearing started about that show, Evil. writing for... So the Kings are this husband and wife team, but they're, they're, they're horror nerds. And they started writing for Roger Corman. They wrote uh, Eric's Revenge, Phantom of the Mall. They wrote uh, The Nest. They wrote just these B horror movies and then did The Good Wife and The Good Fight. And they constantly reference stuff that sometimes on that show you're like, wow, that's an obscure poll. Like that is amazing. <laughs> uh, and, and, and Evil is just so good. It's one of the best horror series I've never seen. All right, yeah, I definitely got to check that out now. Then where is that? Where I think it's on Paramount Plus, I believe. Oh, so I won't be watching Paramount Plus. Yeah, it was it was <laughs> on CB, it was on CBS first season, and then it got canceled. And moved Paramount Plus, and they're just untethered on that, so they can do whatever they want, and it's oh, awesome. Yeah. They're just they're <laughs> off the leash, right? Um, and she's gonna be in the Gilded Age. I think that's uh, gonna be on HBO coming up soon. That that shot, uh, not too far from here. That shot over in Troy. Oh, did it really? Yeah, yeah. Which is like 10, 15 minutes from here. I don't know why, but like production companies are flooding this area. Tax breaks, probably. <laughs> yeah, 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 I guess yeah. so. It's also it's <laughs> close Excuse to me, New York um, City, right? Relatively speaking. Yeah, yeah. We're we're right in between New York and Boston, two hours each way. Yeah, so they can they can get um, curves and Moving stuff. on, we have Yeah, yeah. Uh Bill Mosley, we who we've mentioned a couple times, he's you know, most likely uh Probably he is from the he is B movie movies. horror royalty. Yeah, for sure. Going back to is it the second uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Uh, scrolling yep. to the bottom of his IMDb. <laughs> Christian yeah. Byrne. Uh, Bill yeah. told me an, an amazing. Uh, he's in the Blob so, remake, which we did uh, an episode on. He he grew up in Connecticut and he went to it's college. Solid movie went to college in Boston, and uh, he actually saw. saw uh, the original night, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre in the combat zone in Boston while he was going to college. He he went. It was on a double <laughs> bill with Enter the Dragon, and oh, the wow. combat zone was like our 42nd Street, just this like sleazy, gross place. And he went into Enter the Dragon and then just saw this movie, and was like, "What the hell did I just see?" And sat through another That's screening bill, of it and man. went and saw it every day that it was playing to figure out what the hell this movie was and then he got cast in tcm2 because he made a parody video of him as the hitchhiker from the original movie <laughs> like a short yeah. comedy playing him that made its way to toby hooper who was like oh cast him in the new one." Oh wow that's crazy <laughs> I, i've said it before i'll say it again i hate the fact that he made the sequel a straight comedy movie oh yeah. i love it it's just I love it. I don't. I don't <laughs> hate it as a movie. I hate it as a sequel to Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Because but that, I feel that was, like that's the only direction you could go. 
I, yeah, I mean, you could either leave it alone and do something, like, completely fresh as a comedy, like a black comedy, like he wanted to do. But if, I don't know, it just felt like a, a like a really cheap kind of way to cash in on the original and then just not to me, do, nah. Didn't do it justice for to me. To me, I feel like, yeah, no, I could see that. Uh, to me, I feel like it was... It was inevitable they were making a sequel to that movie, and yeah. his sequel is a great parody of how we commercialized and monetized really sleazy horror in the 80s. Stuff that in the 70s yeah. was kind of under by the 80s became really slick and commercial and i think the best example of that is how like industrial the chef is in part two you know he's yeah. like he's like a yuppie he's moving on up you know like that yeah that kind of that i don't know i just love that dennis hopper is ridiculous in that movie but i think <laughs> i think they just let him do whatever he wanted yeah just show up and be dennis hopper because yeah, he's a psychopath I think that's to begin true with everything yes yeah. everything he's ever been in i think that's <laughs> we'll pay you in some rare art like you know <laughs> it'll be good <laughs> although the opening um, scene of that movie with the um the no one lives forever on go bongo song and those frat dude like that is that's a great opening scene yeah yeah i, I don't know man it's just i don't hate the movie i hate i hate the way it makes me feel like <laughs> yeah no i could i could i could see that but, but when i look at part three where they tried to go back and do more of like a sequel in the tone of the first one. It's a disaster. <laughs> was was three the one with Matthew McConaughey? That's four. That's four. four the okay. next and Renee generation. Zellweger, yeah. Three, yeah. yeah three's Ugh. the one that um Burr made. And it's it's the one that had an amazing trailer. One of the best trailers I've ever seen. Where it's in this idyllic woods. And it ends up being Leatherface from behind. But you don't know it's him. And this hand comes up from the water. So you think it's going to be like an Excalibur type type thing but it has the chainsaw in it <laughs> and then he grabs <laughs> it and turns around to the camera and it's such a cool trailer yeah. um but the movie does not live up to it actually i no. think <laughs> funhouse funhouse is a better sequel to texas chance of massacre in a lot of ways really i i think i've seen funhouse once like a million years ago love it i think, I think it's my that, favorite that might have been one of those I think it might have been one of those old like Monster Vision. Yeah, I don't episodes. think I've seen it. I I definitely saw this movie on, on Monster Vision way back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> um, some of the other no, like notable horror stuff that Bill Mosley's been in. Um, he was in uh, Army of Darkness. Uh, he was just in a real like bit part in that. Yeah. Um, yeah. We mentioned the Rob Zombie uh, horror trilogy there. Um, something I wanted to mention that was Carnival, which was uh, on HBO, which was a very weird show, but I I, I absolutely loved it at the time. Um, it starred Nick Stahl from Terminator Three, and um, oh, ugh. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, if that's your pull point, I'm, I'm just telling I'm you not, that, that's yeah, I'm not right. on board. That's what he's known for. Like, wasn't don't he hold in, that wasn't against he in disturbing Carnival. behavior. Was it disturbing behavior? Oh, was it or the, the one where that he was in? Uh, I think it was disturbing behavior. That's the one I remember in the preview. They like the the blonde girl like smashes her head into the mirror. Yeah, <laughs> he's good yeah. in that. That is disturbing behavior. <laughs> um, but yeah, check out Carnival. It's one of those shows that ended on like a huge kind of like event, like cliffhanger. And then like they, oh yeah, we're always going to finish this up. And then they just never finished it up. Yeah. When they were, they were gunning for Clancy season Brown. three or something, Clancy right? Brown. Yes. Yeah. He's like this evil preacher. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. Too. I love Clancy Brown. Oh, it's so yeah. good in that. The Kurgan. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Krabs. <laughs> Um, and let's see anything. I, I don't want to sell Bill Mosley short, but I mean, like he's in a ton of horror stuff. Um, let's see most recent stuff. Uh, he's got a lot of stuff in the past, like couple of years. Holy Lord. That's a lot of pre-production credits. Yeah. So if you haven't seen Bill Mosley yet, it looks like you're going to see him at some point <laughs> between now and 2023. It looks like. Oh, shit. He's gonna play David Parker Ray in Toy Box. What's He's it? he was another like crazy serial killer. Oh like, really? Insane. Yeah. All right. He had a um. Sorry, let me look at the Toy Box. Yeah, go for it. 
Uh, he had a a like sex torture dungeon built into his house. Ooh, oh yeah, yeah. Looks like the whole series is about him. True crime, uh, true crime. Oh, it's a film. Sorry. Yeah. True crime horror film about the victims and their horrifying ordeal being held captive by a sexual sadist serial killer. Yeah, he was a bad, bad man. Huh. All right, that looks pretty cool. Uh, and then finally, uh, Heather Mazur. This was another actor who like absolutely killed it in one-offs. She was the daughter, um, uh, Sarah Cooper, I believe her name is the uh, the girl who's you know been bitten. Mm-hmm. Um, we only really see her as a zombie, pretty much. Other than that, she's just laying on the table. Um, this was her first movie, Night of the Living Dead. Um, and then after that, like nothing until two uh, two thousand three, and then she's just everywhere. It looks like she was on the show Numbers. Um, she was on Joey, the terrible friend spinoff. <laughs> Um, was was numbers a spinoff of the movie? No, wasn't that like a um, no? Yeah, just same title. Yeah, they were this like was predicting about like crimes. A... Like they had like a math, like yeah, math model for yeah. predicting crimes or something like that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um. Oh, hold on. I keep getting this message. Um. Aside from that, it looks like she was on CSI, Medium. She was on the TV series of the movie Crash. Um. Law and Order, uh, CSI again, a couple of flavors of CSI, uh, The Mentalist, Bones, Pretty Little Liars. Um, so she was on a lot of CBS. Yeah, that's what you're telling me. All ABC too, Modern ABC, Family, yeah. Glee on Fox, House of Lies on you know, on uh, Showtime, Castle, NCIS. Like she's everywhere. It seems. I loved Castle. I st- I heard that was really good. I've never seen an episode. It, I love Nathan Fillion. Well, it it started off amazing and then just like flatlined in the middle and dropped way off at the end i still watched every episode <laughs> uh and then most recently on tacoma fd it looks like uh and that will pretty much do it for our better known as segment that's the uh pretty much the bigger people in the movie yeah uh as usual we always kind of jump the gun on the on like the freeform segment and just kind of sprinkle movie. it throughout the show <laughs> yeah <laughs> but that's fine yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Closing thoughts on this. Like, I, I definitely need a, a zombie break of like maybe 10 years or so before I like, I think we can get another good zombie movie. We definitely need to let like Walking Dead just shuffle off. But well, they need to stop making money on The Walking Dead. Yeah. And AMC then... needs to stop making spinoffs of The Walking Dead. Well, in 2000, yeah. zombies became wish fulfillment instead of horror. Like that sort of like, man, it'd be so cool if I'd like be the king of my town. You just go around shooting and zombies. Just sort of, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, it got like video gamified. Um, but there's some cool zombie movies that people have yet to discover. Um, there, there's two in the 70s that I really love. One's called Messiah of Evil. Have you guys seen that movie? No. I don't think I've seen that one, no. <clears throat> It's 1972. It's it's streaming um, on Prime, and you can find it. Um, it's sort of this like weird Lovecraftian um, zombie movie. It doesn't make a ton of sense, but in a good way. It has that sort of weird, like uh, disturbing, just kind of like, but you can't stop watching kind of vibe. Like like yeah, the, right. like your mindset at like three in the morning, um, and it was written by the married yeah. couple who wrote American Graffiti and Howard the Duck. And they were always putting in Lovecraftian things like Howard the Duck, the whole Dark Overlords thing is Lovecraft. <laughs> and so this yeah. movie has all that in there. Um, but that's worth watching. There's also a movie called uh, Death Dream. Duck boobs are pretty Lovecraftian, too. Duck boobs. That's true. Yeah, that's our ducks. Ducks weren't <laughs> um, But uh, there's a movie called Death Dream from 1976. That's Bob Clark, who did uh, Black Christmas and Christmas Story, um, but it's it's basically <laughs> the monkey's paw, but, but the the most anti-Vietnam movie I've ever seen, and has just some of the best uh, disturbing zombie stuff in it. That uh, just scenes from that movie just absolutely haunt me. Um, and then there's another movie from '86 that kind of disappeared but you can see it now and it, it, it's billed as sort of a comedy but it really isn't and it's called um it's called uh night oh my god why did i forget the name it's got john Aston in it <laughs> and it's got uh scott grimes 
and it's called oh christ i just had it now i have to look it up (laughs) to the internet (laughs) jeez my brain it was just on my brain hold on uh it's called i jesus um but it's really good (laughs) and it it had sat the shelf for a few years um but that's another one I don't know, really like that kind of if if you're sick of new stuff, there's still some that we could go back and view that um yeah, haven't absolutely. really been remade or rediscovered. Put them on our list. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, for sure. There's there's been some modern stuff that I I do um like because you can tell that it's people getting tired of the same old tired ass zombie movie. Yeah. Like Warm Bodies was a, just a delicious twist on the, the zombie genre really I, I couldn't get over the zombie love story like, that's what made it so good it's yeah. like it's so ass backwards from everything else you're gonna see yeah i haven't seen it oh it's soundtrack is amazing too <laughs> um there's another one uh i think it was a i think it was a show daybreakers, daybreakers oh yeah was the vampire one with uh oh was it yeah uh, uh yeah i think it was on netflix and it was like high school kids um, oh, with yes. the apocalypse yeah, yeah. and shit. Like I think, right? Daybreakers? Oh, I know I know what you're talking about. Did you ever see I... my, my boyfriend? My boyfriend's back? Did you ever see my boyfriend's back? The oh, Bob yeah. Balaban movie? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when it first hit VHS. <laughs> <sighs> they really, That's... they took that from him and really changed it. It was originally called Johnny zombie and it was a lot more like a john waters movie but i i kind of still like what came out yeah <laughs> you know what i would love to see a john waters zombie movie yeah <laughs> there you go <laughs> well the jim jarmusch one <laughs> right oh yeah the one with bill murray and uh adam driver the dead don't die the dead don't die oh yeah like oh, i yeah. I always like cue that up and then find something else that I really want to watch instead. It's very, very dry humor. Like it, it wasn't bad. I didn't, I don't know. I didn't dislike it, but I wasn't like crazy about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I'm trying to think of the last like really, really good zombie movie that I got into. And like, I honestly like Shaun of the dead, obviously one, but that's almost 20 years ago at this point. Yeah. That feels Did you bad, ever see Pont- Did yeah. you ever see uh Pont- Pontypool? Oh no, that we um I did a like a zombie film festival a couple of years ago and that was one of the movies they were like talking about and showing and doing a panel on. I I, yeah, I got to see that one. That's the one where it's amazing. contagious through That's like really... words, right? Yeah, yeah. It's really good. Huh. All right, yeah, another one for the list. Yeah. Just keep um that. The Girl with All the Gifts, that was a good one too. Um it's this girl. She's you know like infected as a zombie, but like she doesn't present as a zombie. Like she's just like a normal. Like, oh, she's girl. asymptomatic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess that's kind of relevant yeah, now. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to watch. The, like, there's been some stuff that I've watched that I'm like, oh, that was interesting. I never want to see it again. Stuff like Dead Girl, which was really fascinating and and well done, but it's just really grim and disturbing. Um, yeah. yeah. Or even like Cell, you know the the Stephen King adaptation. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, w- hashtag alive was good. Oh, that was the Korean one we watched, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Over over the pandemic, we were doing like an Asian horror movie night, like every Sunday, and that was one that we watched. That one was really good. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, like I said, I just needed like a break on zombies. I think we culturally, like, just need them to go away for a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to well, predict the, what the uh, next the, the... fad is going to be, but. It's, it's the whole, like, I've seen the anime and they are aspect of it totally lost now. Um, and the other thing that people embraced was they took the horror out of things like witches and vampires and those sorts of things and made them like erotic rules, you know, yeah. like role yeah. playing things. So there's not a lot left. Um, it's, it's a weird thing. Speaking of Asian flicks, if you seen the seventh you cut out there the seventh what the seventh curse with Chai Yun Fat from 86 
Oh, no. No, I haven't seen that one. That's streaming. That is bonkers. <laughs> really? <laughs> Watch that right after we stop talking. It is awesome. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Can do. <laughs> Oh man, yeah. I uh... I think the only thing they haven't been able to like homogenize is like a good possession movie. Like if you have a good one, it's always going to be good. I um I just watched one actually yesterday that was pretty good. It's almost like a reverse possession movie. Um, anything for Jackson? It's on Shutter. It is. It's the it's uh, the premise. It's this hit you this hit you with this right up front. The premise is there's like this elderly couple, their daughter and their grandson die, and basically what they want to do is kidnap a pregnant woman and then like send their grandson's soul into her baby. Okay, and it's it's pretty creepy. Like there's like black magic going on, and yeah. then, like it starts off kind of like a slow burn, but then like just crazy shit starts happening, and like people just start like coming up to their house and like killing themselves. And like, there's like, a lot of like, what the fuck moments. Yeah. Um, it was, it was pretty good. Uh, the ending, I don't know. I, I kind of like zoned out a little bit towards the end, but overall I, I give it a thumbs up. Anything for Jackson. It's on shutter right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I guess that could be our next, you know, horror craze that we beat to death possession movie. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're working on the haunted house right now. So yeah. Yeah. Have you seen Extra Extraordinary? That sounds familiar, and I don't know why. I don't think I've seen it though. It's a, it's an Irish horror comedy that Maeve Higgins wrote and stars in. It. It's it's also really really good. Hmm. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. Keep putting it on the list. Yeah. <laughs> if yeah. nothing else, we got yeah. a bunch of new movies sort of, for. Our yeah. List. I know. It's it's sort of like an Irish version of the Frighteners almost. Um, it's it's very good. I'm. Um, I'm down. <laughs> yeah, we were just talking about this, I think, like an episode or two ago. Like, The Frighteners, I think, is a very, like, underrated movie. A lot of people don't talk about it. Oh, yeah. That. Yeah. It's a great movie. Yeah, it's just kitschy enough to, to be entertaining, but then all the, the scares are still legitimate. Yeah. You know what I would say is a is a great homage slash semi-remake of Night of the Living Dead that is well worth watching is Demon Knight. Tells from the Crypt Demon Knight. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a fun movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought you were gonna say Night of the Living Dead 3D with Sid Haig. Yeah, 3D. <laughs> or or Night of the Living Dead 2 yeah. Part Three or any of the other cash-ins they've done in the last few years. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. I mean, this is uh after like, we were talking about Romero stuff. After this, we got Land of the Dead. Was Survival of the Dead the next one after that? The one like on the island, like I think it was like in Nova uh, Scotia. No, no, Diary of the Dead was next, which was the found footage one. Then Survival of the Dead, um, and then between uh, in the nineties, he made Bruiser. I've never yeah. seen that. One. Yep, yep. Did. Bruiser's. Uh, I didn't really same... enjoy it. Like... No, it's not good. <laughs> He showed. That's also when he directed that video for the for the. Oh, sorry. Is he directed the the video for the Misfits cover band that featured member Misfits uh, hey, called the Misfits? Hey, uh, hey. Scream. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I love Michael Graves era Misfits. I don't like Michael Graves oh, now he because like he's this... a proud boy. <laughs> he sounds like the singer from Bare Naked Ladies. <laughs> <laughs> and. <laughs> This is where we used to live. <laughs> uh, oh, man. I will die on the hill that Michael Graves' era is just <laughs> as good listen, as Danzig era. Listen to those records. <laughs> uh, yeah. Famous Monsters. So good. Has it been well, a while that, that was the thing was... with the Miss. No, yeah. it really hasn't. <laughs> but. <laughs> um. That whole thing was good because they they embraced that like cartoony side of horror. Like with Danzig, it was very sure. like edge lord, super dark, whatever kind of thing. And then they were like, you know what's also great? Being campy. And then they sure. leaned real hard into that while writing songs with super catchy choruses and, and good riffs. And I'll die on that hill. 
<laughs> yeah, but again, I think it's more of a Misfits cover band than anything else. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is true. In fact, though, I said that, that to Michael Gr- There are zero original members once Danzig left. I I, I said to Michael Graves uh, in in recent years, "You're a dude who sang in a Misfits cover band twenty years ago. <laughs> Why does anyone care about <laughs> anything you have to say?" <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> yeah, I, my my old band Should've actually opened Steel. up for him at one point. Oh, I love Peter Steele. Oh, he's a. I miss him every he was, day. He was supposed to do it. He was supposed to. Was save he really? The Get the it fuck out Vanian of my life. It was Dave from the Dam. Yeah, it was Dave Vanian from the Damned at first, who the Misfits have harassed for years, um, and he was going to do it because the Dam weren't doing anything. And then they pulled a bunch of weird crap, like in his contract, they wanted him to be able to bench press a certain amount and all this stupid yeah. stuff. And he was yeah. Like, well, because he had to have the look. Um, yeah. Then, yeah, and then they and then they had Peter Steele, and Peter Steele's actually the one who, after they did a few rehearsals, uh, was like, "Yeah, I don't feel like doing this. Get this Michael Graves kid." <laughs> Graves. Right. In the nineties, yeah. in the nineties, my old band we opened for them at Middle East in Cambridge, and they're the most Jersey meathead friggin' Sopranos. I work. Oh yeah, my dad's construction company, idiot. And they it's a showed machine up shop. With it's a machine vans. shop. <laughs> It's a as an exacto knife factory. Um, so they showed up with two vans. <laughs> One of the vans had all the gear and merchandise, and the other van, I shit you not, had a full gym. So before the show, they brought in all this like <laughs> n- Nautilus, like Nordic, like all these weights, and they all came in wearing Zubas, <laughs> gold gym shirts. <laughs> And they did this workout, and then they went and put on all their gear, and they clipped on their devil locks, which are little clip-on hair things. And yep. they got it was the funniest thing. It was ridiculous. You you got to get your pump on before you go, you know. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> got to get your vascularity up. Right. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, no, it, it is actually hilarious. It's hilarious to watch a uh, like a Doyle uh, interview because he's just. He is Jersey, like it, in monster makeup. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. Yeah, I actually went to college with Jerry Only's daughter, and she was she was like, oh, you in a band? My dad's in a band. I was like, oh, really? She's like, yeah, Misfits? I was like, that checks out. That checks out. She was like, <laughs> she was like a little Jersey Shore. Yeah, I can hear it. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah, they're they're not good now with Jerry singing at all. No, but he, dancing hasn't been good in twenty. Like he he could sing great for about eighteen months, thirty years ago, and then just blew it. Uh, have you yeah. seen any of his? Uh, you've seen his movies, right? I I oh, saw Veronica. God. <laughs> Awful. And I want to oh, I want to see this new one. Vampire Western. <laughs> oh, so yeah, bad. I actually I laid down on that sword so my friends didn't have to watch it. Oh god awful. God. God awful. I, yeah, he's not exactly a guy that you were like, oh, oh man, he's such a great lyricist. I'd love to see what other thoughts he has. <laughs> well, if only you could put pictures to those thoughts. Uh, well, he does have comic books. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he certainly does. <laughs> I've never read any. I don't want to, but, but they exist. Yeah, there are. I don't know if he has <laughs> <You> either. Can... <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, no, I, I, I'm not gonna lie. I am intending to see that that vampire western that he's got going on right now. I, well, I don't know yeah, when. Maybe <laughs> into masochism, and I'm not. Yeah. You know, I'm not gonna kink shame you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it was either Danzig movies or feet. I made my choice. <laughs> <laughs> one of those has more artistic integrity and uh, musical ability. Yeah. <laughs> one of those uh, think... doesn't literally sound like Grover. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. <laughs> I, I got to say, though, uh, was it uh, Dead Dead Red Sabbath or whatever the fuck that that one album was in recent years not that bad uh yeah, two albums before that were terrible album. 
there is an absolutely yeah. great Tanzing album spread out over 12 albums. <laughs> <laughs> it's the album within an album. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the Facebook page Danzig memes. You got to get on that. Are they all him with his cat <laughs> cat litter? Uh, a lot of them are. Yeah. 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 And uh, holding the microphone upside down like this. I I saw it, he built it as. Hain and Danzig, but it was the same band. And, and in between sets, they like went out and put blood all over them. and came out and did the sets. But he had what I could only describe as shirtless leaves on the whole show which was basically like <laughs> like a like a weird just sleeves and it was like it, it was it was god awful he had a he had a strange <laughs> goth phase like it was real strange like industrial goth about, like, kind of thing oh like the can't speak era which is a bad song yeah uh well, yeah i was uh, like he really should have more vocal effects on. i think it was dancing four uh, yeah, right. Was was for uh, Black Acid Evil. That album was just yeah. garbage, top to bottom. He oh, decimated yeah. it was Black Sabbath like song on said, there. Can you make Ministry not interesting? <laughs> <laughs> Al Jorgensen is sure trying these days. It certainly is. Yeah that that new album is trashola. Yeah, although I did like the last one. I did like Twilight Zone. That was a good was a good song. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, I you're never going to reach the heights. <laughs> you're never going to reach the heights of 1988. <laughs> no, Psalm 69 is done. <laughs> yeah. We've we've changed All your right. podcast. I think this might be a good place to thing about metal yeah. and <laughs> music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, man, do you like Angel Spit? I like Angel Spit. <laughs> um. <laughs> <and you. laughs> This is probably the this is this is when we start really going off the rails at this point. It's probably a good time to like wrap it up. Yeah. Um. But Ken, yeah, this thanks so our, much, this man. Is, it's this is our dancing Sorry, three of podcasting, <laughs> 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 where it's just good enough to get by on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> um. But yeah, man, it's always it's always great talking to you. Uh. Thanks for taking the time to talk with us, man. Yeah. Uh. Tell everybody yeah, where they can find uh, all of the things that you do. <laughs> uh, yeah, the show's at tvguidancecounselor.com. I'm at iCanRead.com. Um, yeah, we're hitting episode 500 soon on year nine. Uh, just that John Damn, Sales on, you. which was really fun. Uh, That's um, amazing. Nice. So we awesome. are, I was going to say, you're the one who always remembers where our... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, you do it this week. Go ahead. Uh, we're Big Dumb Monsters Podcast. You can find us on your... Uh, podcasting platforms. Uh, our Twitter handle is. Come on, you're doing great. Is it at Big Dumb Monsters? No, Pod? it sure isn't. No, 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 it's not. We, you can find us on Twitter <laughs> at Dumb underscore Monsters. There we go. Yeah, <laughs> I'm the one who got us that handle. <laughs> I don't remember it. Uh, and then we're uh, Dumb Monsters, Big Dumb Monsters Pod on Facebook. That's right. All right, I got one of them right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and you can find us on Slasher we're at, at. We're at. We're at New Balance Shoes on Twitter. <laughs> Size nine Avias. There we go. Wasn't taken. Was it taken? It was still available, believe it or not. And now it's all ours. Yep. Uh, and you can also find us on Slasher at Big Dumb Monsters Podcast. All right. Well, uh, that pretty much. Uh, That's it. I'm done. Yeah, I got I nothing. Got... I got no intro even. That's you it. Don't have a, you don't have done. a fancy sign off. <laughs> Which I think we just go bye bye. Yeah, there you go. I'm done. <laughs> this is the I'm end of go. the show. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough. I want to drink some beers. <laughs>